All right, and we're back, everybody. Part two of our coverage tonight. I do apologize, we dropped connection in our first uh, iteration. We already went through a half hour of coverage and breaking down the map and going through the latest story. So if you did miss that, if this is your first stream of the night, welcome. We're happy to have you. Um, you're coming in on part two. So if you want to catch the first half hour of this stream, it should be posting shortly. So uh, right after the stream's up, if you do want to catch the first half hour, go ahead and watch that video. Well, welcome back, everybody. Comment where you're tuned in from. What city, what state, where in the world? Welcome back again, everybody. It's member night. So go ahead and join the YouTube channel if you would like to. If you cannot, the stream will still stay public, but the chat is going to turn to members only shortly. All right, and we're and we're back. All right, hit the like button. Make sure again you're subscribed to the channel. Thank you, Patrick Green, for subscribing. Who else we have? Gorgon, Trike Jobs subscribed. We have Danielle Williams became a member. Patrick Smith subscribed. Who else do we have here? I got the whole list. Littlekin became a member. Who else we have here? Mark Parker subscribed. Number nine subscribed. We got Pamela Hash subscribed. Eric K, welcome to the channel. Welcome back. Jacksonville, Florida, New Orleans, Sydney, Australia. We're just waiting for, I don't know, if you guys are watching the replay of this stream, this is where we got to let the stream populate. Notifications are just getting sent out right now. Some people are just getting it. It happens at different times. So if you ever watch live streams, that's why streamers like take like two to five minutes before they actually get started because notifications take a while to get out to everybody casper wyoming are for our, for us we have the intro the intro video by the time that plays usually a lot of people are in the stream already how you doing dh celebrating seven months but i've been watching for longer than that thank you daniel hello from newport oregon i'm not a member but i'll be watching that's what i'm talking about perfect so anyways y'all Again, this is part two of our stream. I just had bad, we lost connection. I just reset everything and then rescheduled the stream and now we're back. All right, here we go. Thank you to everybody for tuning in. I'm gonna set the chat to members now and then just get right back into it, right where we left off. So we just, where we left off was the fires in Russia and it, seemed, it appears to be wildfires in Siberia. It's about 2,000, 1,900 to 2,000 miles east of Moscow. And that is uh, the news that we left off. So. Now we're going to be switching gears here to the upcoming May 9th Victory Day. The Z symbols, fewer tanks, and no guests. Russia prepares to mark Victory Day as Ukraine war rages. So this is straight from the Moscow Times talking about uh, the upcoming Victory Day parade. Welcome, Tim. Thank you so much. Russia will mark Monday as the Soviet Union's victory over Nazism. Again, this is from the Moscow Times. Amid expectations that ongoing fighting in Ukraine will cast a long shadow over the popular event. In particular, the set-piece military parade on Moscow's Red Square will see significantly fewer soldiers and equipment compared to last year, which experts have linked to significant losses sustained by Russia in its ongoing war in neighboring Ukraine. This is one of the few times when Russia is conducting a conventional war at its borders at the same time as it's having a parade. And, and give a... Snetkinov, an expert in Russian foreign policy at University College in London, College London, told the Moscow Times. The reduction of the parade shows that Russian government is both aware of the losses and is trying to manage how, the, how to deal with them. Russia's May 9th celebrations, also known as Victory Day, marked the Soviet Union's victory over Nazi Germany in 1945 and have been increasingly used by President Vladimir Putin as means to promote patriotic unity and showcase the country's military might. Given the absence of significant military gains in Ukraine, the Kremlin is expected to reorient this year's event to justify the invasion of Ukraine. Among other poor war additions, a group of fighter jets are expected to fly over central Moscow in the shape of a Z, a popular symbol of support for Russian troops in Ukraine. While the number of planes expected to take part in Moscow fly past is slightly higher than last year, the numbers of infantry and equipment are lower. Compared to about 191 military vehicles, about 12,000 military personnel in 2021, this year there will only be 129 military vehicles and about 10,000 personnel. According to information published Friday, that's, I mean, 2,000 less personnel and a significant less amount of vehicles. Russia speeches will focus on drawing parallels between Soviet Union's war against Nazi Germany and how Russia is, quote, alone in their fight against a contemporary Nazism in Ukraine, uh, said Alison Edwards, an expert on Russian militarism at Britain's University of Warwick. 
Russian President Vladimir Putin has repeatedly spoken out against Western countries that seem not to appreciate the Soviet contribution of, to the defeat of the Nazi Germany in World War II. About 27 million Soviet, Soviet citizens were killed in four years of conflict. At the same time, showcasing Russia's role in the defeat of Nazism, celebrations this year have been designed to bolster recruitment into the armed forces by motivating Russians to continue the deeds and victories of their ancestors. Western officials and observers have warned that the Kremlin may be planning to announce a mobilization of reservists or civilians on May 9th in order to boost the country's flagging military campaign in Ukraine that is reportedly hampering by problems that include a lack of infantry. This has been denied by top Russian officials. Either way, many Russians, particularly those who fled the country at the beginning of the invasion because of political persecution or conscription, will be watching events on May 9th closely for a sign of how the war will unfold in the coming months. Unlike previous years, Victory Day events will be held in the absence of foreign leaders. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said last month that no foreign leaders were invited to the Victory Day parade this year because it was not a, a round number anniversary, unlike 2005 or 2010. It's our own holiday, a sacred holiday for Russia and all Russians, he said. But Putin was accompanied at the parade on Red Square in 2017 by Moldovan President Igor Dondin, by the Kazakhstan head of state Nurslan Nazarbayev the year before. One Victory Day event that will be scrutinized for signs of the extent of popular support, support of the fighting in Ukraine will be the so-called Immortal Regiment marches, traditionally attended by hundreds of thousands of Russians, including Putin himself. Edward said there will likely be a record turnout at the Immortal Regiment rallies given that the event has been held online during the coronavirus pandemic. Russia often positions itself as a martial keeper, preserver of memory, so it will pitch to the Immortal Regiment as a struggle to preserve the memory of the great patriotic war against those it believes are diminishing it or wiping it out. Russia may even attempt to stage Victory Day parades or Immortal Regiment events in captured Ukrainian city of Mariupol. No, that's not going to happen. We already learned that today. They're not, uh, they're, Russia's not holding a parade in Mariupol. There are also fears that in Ukraine that the May 9th celebrations in Russia could be used as an excuse for an intensification of attacks of Ukrainian military positions. Been longer than a month, 13 months. Thank you, Sam. I'm squinting. No, it's just from the light. It's not from the text. Yeah. I actually had to turn down the brightness on there. That is the update from the parade. Z symbols, fewer tanks, and no guests. Straight from a Russian source, the Moscow Times. All right, next article. Putin believes doubling down will improve Ukraine war outcomes, CIA director says from Reuters. May 7th, Reuters, U.S. Central Intelligence Agency director William Burns said on Sunday that Russian President Vladimir Putin believes doubling down on the military conflict in Ukraine will improve his outcome in the war. He's in a frame of mind in which he doesn't believe he can afford to lose, said Burns, who was speaking at a Financial Times event in Washington. I think he's convinced right now that doubling down will still enable him to make progress. Putin believes doubling down will improve Ukraine war outcome. From the CIA director. Alright, now let's get to John Sweeney on Twitter. These are our, he's been providing a, a daily diary of his his experience in Kiev, Ukraine during the war, and just talking about some of his insight and knowledge along the way. This is his update from day 70. Again, this is John Sweeney on Twitter. Kiev diary, day 73 of Vladimir Putin's war. So I haven't done this before first day. But uh, will Vladimir Putin nuke Kiev? Will he nuke Ukraine? Because he's losing the war in Donbass. So I've spoken to two psychiatrists, Semyon Glusman, who spent 10 years in the Gulag, guarded by the KGB. And he says, no, uh, Putin is bad, but not mad. And secondly, I've spoken to Professor Jim Fallon, his professor of psychiatry at the University of California, and he too says that Putin is a rational psychopath. He lies beautifully. He lies without flaw. 
he's good, but he's not mad mad. So, for people who are worried about stuff, I'm going to have to break here because I'm going downhill. <laughs> I'm going to stop. Because <laughs> I'm not a nutter. <laughs> There's arguments against that. But my view is that Putin will not hit the nuclear button. And if he does, the machinery around him, they note that hand that gripped the table when he uh, ordered General Shoigu, the defence minister, not to, um, not to seize the steel plants in Maripol. They note those puffy cheeks. Not a well man. I don't think the Russian machinery, the Kremlin's machinery, will obey him. So that's the good news. Love from Keith. That is the update from John. I had some fall behind me. All right, now let's go to... Let's go to the war clips from the day. Any combat happenings or military movements. Military situation as of 07 May 2022, according to Wikipedia. And any other clips that have been surfaced or posted online. If you are a veteran or if you have served in any armed forces around the world, go ahead and comment. Members, thank you again so much. Uh, if you're tuned in, comment your branch. Comment uh, what years of service that you served. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm personally an Army veteran. I served uh, from 2012 to 2020 active duty for four years and then I served in the Army Reserves. I was at 88 or active duty in Alaska. Then I was in the Army Reserves here in Minnesota as an 88 Mike motor transport operator. So here's a military situation as of 07 May. Thank you to all of our veterans. Ukrainian Barakdar TB2 in action over in the Black Sea. that are near that work is out there, she said. Long distance view of the TB2 strike on Snake Island. From a second, secondary. Destroying all the buildings on there. So that left Snake Island. Destruction of Russian 2S3 Akatasias with a big shockwave.
152 millimeter. Another 152 millimeter. Those are okay. Those are what those are. Those are what those were, I should say. Not anymore. There's no audio for this clip. Oh yeah, you can see the shockwave over the whole trees right there. Oh my goodness, that one blew up. Yeah, they they got the whole stockpile or the whole all any they got the whole thing right there. Thank you, Susan, for subscribing. Thank you, Gillian. Wow. Oh, wow. Did you see that shockwave? I'm going to play that back. I'm going to play this clip back. There were a couple of shock waves in that. Dang, that one was a, that one was a more visible one than the first one. You saw the I saw the whole ring. No, no, let's go back on that one. I'll pause it when I see the shockwave. So, destruction of Russian 2S3 Akatasias. Did we look up a video on that? I think we did. 2S3. Maybe we didn't. Here's what the here's what was destroyed. Looks like something we looked up there. I haven't seen this video. This is what they blew up and it looks like they destroyed the all uh, the stockpile of ammunition that was next to it. Or any any ammunition that they had. Sorry, tank looks like it's from World War Two. Trevor John, thank you for subscribing to the channel. So that's what was hit here. Let's go back to the full video now. <clears throat> All in the tree line. I gave an example. You can see it's starting to catch fire. Very thick, or very, excuse me, thick. Very thin tree line that they have those tanks stored in. Unless those things just burn so hot and then they explode that bad, but that was those are some big shockwaves that we're gonna see here, like that one, that first one, right there, shockwave coming out. Very tall smoke plume, too. Or explosion. Uh, 
Oh, there it is. Look at that. I'll play that one. Let's play that part back. Big shockwave. Visible shockwave. Man, that's a tall smoke plume. A Russian rocket barrage targeting a park in Kharkiv. We saw this clip. We saw these a, uh, a couple days ago, but if you haven't seen this yet, a Russian, Russian rocket barrage in the park. This is they have like a mu it's an amusement park and there it playgrounds for kids. This is in Kharkiv, eastern city in Ukraine. In the north Donbass. This is Wild West. It was like a themed a nice themed park, like in different sections, and that was we went through that and looked went through the park a couple days ago in the maps. If you guys want to catch that stream, just go back in our playlist. It's different camera angles from this one, though. Ukrainian Marines, thirty six brigade, using a javelin against a Russian tank. Yes, Ukrainian Barakdar TB2 drone striking a Russian Tor SAM system on Snake Island. This was yesterday, and then today they destroyed all the infrastructure on the building. Russian soldier films from a trench as artillery fire is incoming. Russian soldier. This is fighting in the Azovstal plant, which again, all... Well, women, children, and elderly have been evacuated from the plant. It can, can all, it's been confirmed and reported all day. In terms of the, the military, the military is still, is still under the plant. So there's still going to be fighting and we're still going to see videos. Uh, but all the, the elderly women and children have been evacuated per the, or per Western and Russian sources. Both have confirmed it. <laughs> Ukrainian artillery hits a Russian helicopter as well as a Russian ammo depot. Ukrainian artillery crew in action. Oh, 
SU 24M bombs Ukrainian fortified positions. Russian plane bombing Ukrainian positions. See the smoke behind the tree line. Hard to see in this video exactly when they hit. This is a Russian video, right? Yeah, SU-25. Alright, that is the, the clips from the 7th. Now let's go to the newest newest. While we're still on the the war videos or the war clips, low flying Ukrainian Su twenty five aircraft from twenty from two hours ago. <laughs> DNR fighters in near the Azovstal plant. So again, their Russian forces are planning to move in on Ukrainian forces within that Azovstal plant in Mariupol. Here's some photos. Hey, John, welcome. Thank you so much for joining the channel. Again, y'all, Saturdays only is the chat uh, set to members only. Just Saturdays. That's the only day that the chat that we give back. Screenshots from a video posted three days ago showing Russian Spetsnaz in the Lehman area with 1P87 optics. The video shows multiple bodies. Second video of that captured Ukrainian BTR-80. Here's the first one. Here's the first video. Two videos from a Russian sor Russian source showing a captured Ukrainian BTR. <laughs> Oops, I didn't finish reading. Captured Ukrainian BTR-80. They note that it received a useful and cost-effective modernization with a thermal imager, CH-4215 satellite navigation system, and a modern comm system from Turkey's Azlan. <laughs> Yes, Russian forces are have sent troops into the Azovstal. Like that's modern stuff in there. <laughs> Second video of that captured Ukrainian beach. Oh, it's a boy visitor. Hi from Australia. How you doing, Denise? Oh, it's a boy visitor. Look at it. Trying to act like their equipment isn't old and junk. Another video of those Russian DNR fighters. Oh, we got a first one. So here's video posted on May 4th showing Russian DNR troops in a trench north of Donetsk with a trench periscope. Mina. Russian video. Russian
Ну, либо не взорвалась, либо промах. Ну да, да, свист-то мы слышали. Вот такая примерно обстановка сейчас на Донецком направлении. Перед нами Пески, перед нами Авдеевка. Буквально вот пара часов затишья. Сменилась работа и минометов. К счастью, мы слышали свист минометной мины. Мина не взорвалась. Сейчас уже в обе стороны начинается артиллерийская дуэль. Разрывы видишь? Да, вижу. Можно вот так вот прям камеру навести. Даже с телефона. Давай, 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 сейчас увидишь. Я понял, вот по центру сейчас. И там дым виден, да? Да. Да, да, виден, виден. Секунд 10. Это дыма. Где попадает? Дым. Где дым? А, да. На 12 часов. Наши сейчас отвечают, правильно? Давят тихо стрелял. Да, подавляют. Минометы работают, да? Савушка. Ну, слушай, отлично, да? То есть один выстрел с их стороны и сразу наши э, уже давят. То есть раньше такого не было. Так точно. Буквально год назад был на этом же месте, и ситуация была абсолютно обратная. Под прикрытием перемирия постоянно шел огонь с украинской стороны по нам. И невозможно было отвечать, только фиксировали это. Сегодня первая же мина сразу же превратилась в подавление украинских огневых точек. И оно сейчас продолжается. Они пытаются отвечать, вот сейчас пошла украинская мина, был слышен свист, но, естественно, это совершенно не тот масштаб. И хочется сказать, что вот когда находишься здесь, абсолютно четко видно, что обстановка изменилась, что односторонняя война, односторонний Минск, который был год назад, сейчас превратился в настоящую войну, и в ней украинцы чувствуют себя далеко не так хорошо, как им казалось год назад, что они воюют с русской армией. Видели и противника, отрабатывали по нему. Okay, and then is there a second video? Yep. Another video of those same Russian DNR fighters. Пошли, Грань, покажи мне, что где. По наблюдению. Again, these are Russian soldiers. Левее, сторонника в губ. Разрывы видишь? Да, вижу. Можно вот так вот прям камеру навести, даже с телефона. Давай, 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 сейчас попробуем. Не, не черта. Назад немножко. Оп. Вот там. Не пойму дымов. Видно вот сейчас, да? Подожди, давай вот так сейчас сделаем. Проведи меня прям по экрану телефона. Так. Давай. Давай я. Держи, держи. Это максимально, это 6 крат. Я понял, вот, по центру сейчас. И там дым виден, да? Посмотрю, лось, лось. Я пошел, посмотрю. Пошли, глянь, покажи мне, что где. По наблюдению. No? Can I get a location? Marking? I just got it like out here, huh? Where is it showing on the... Right along the road. There we go. That doesn't look right though. No, oh, that is right. Just different. It's got the water here. It's right here. Can't go there. Now we can go here. Nope. We can go as far as this road. I wonder if we can look in the area. You can we can look in there, but you can't we can't go. All that's taking place over here. This picture was taken in 2011, where these photos were. So all that is in 
Okay, yeah, that makes sense. 2011 now, I mean, they've been at war over in this region since 2014. There wouldn't be any new photos. I wonder if this road even is good still. All right, continuing on. Video posted, we saw that. Video of Rose Gavirda Spetsnaz in the Kharkiv in the Kharkiv Oblast with a captured anti-tank systems. Kharkiv is over in the north Donbass, I'll show you. Zoom out. North Donbass. Eastern Ukraine. So here's Kiev, capital city. I'm circling it with my mouse, or where my, my pointer is, and then here's, Har here's Kharkiv over here. Zooming in. Rosgevirda Spetsnaz. Like the video if you guys have it, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Ну, рассказывайте, что удалось обнаружить, что перед нами. При проведении разведывательно поисковых мероприятий в одном из населенных пунктов в лесном массиве был обнаружен схрон, так, заранее подготовленный, в котором было обнаружено противотанковые средства иностранного производства, вот, в данном случае представлены. Это что за, что за вооружение? Это, из каких стран? Это гранатомет производства зарубежного, называется «Сократ». Угу. Соответственно, и Противотанковое средство для уничтожения танков предназначено, называется НЛАВ. Соответственно... А страны производства? Ну, точно я не могу сказать. Подозреваю... Это польское производство. Это Англия. И подвергает... He's, this is the equipment that they keep destroying our whole military with. <laughs> Destroyed Russian Tiger vehicle. This is the Russian MRAP, or was. It's on its... <laughs> Upside down on the ground. We saw that in the... In the compilation, we saw the air defense strike. Matt, we'll come back to at the end. All right, that is the war, the newest war clips that we haven't seen since uh, this afternoon's live stream. Let's continue on now with uh, posts that were sent to the Discord video. This is a Canadian fighting in Ukraine describes the hell he witnessed. Posted on May fifth from CBS News. You've just come from roughly where? From the east. Uh, we were uh, in the Eastern Front, uh, in the Donbass region. What was that like? Um, I have one word to describe and it's, it's just hell. Yeah, hell. And why? Because every day you're getting casualties. Every day you're getting your friends getting killed. And it's days after, after days. And most of the missions actually of my uh, uh, my friends uh, that they come from the Marines uh, from the States. It was just going to recover dead bodies of our friends that, that were killed in action from their previous patrol. So, yeah, it was life over there for us. Look at the bags under his eyes. Just look at the way he looks. Now he's, he's, he has the thousand mile stare. What has what has been your main job there? Look right through you. Uh, for me, I was just uh, used as a uh, some as a uh, infantry s soldier. Actually, um, I was paired up uh, with the Canadian sniper Wally. So I he was partnered. He was partners with a sniper named Wally. I was his uh, teammate, so we were always to together, and I made I was making sure to help him as much as I can. And I was always following him everywhere. Uh, I was carrying ammunition. Um, so yes, mainly that was my uh, 
my main job over there. Did you find yourself in direct contact? Oh yes. Oh yes. You want to take me through that? But you're not talking about just artillery. You're talking about direct contact. Right? So do you, so are we talking about just the east? Or can I talk about? You can European? talk about wherever you want. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I mean, <clears throat> me me and Wally's first missions in Irpin, uh It was uh, to go into a apartment a apartment b building and set up a sniper position f from there. So we go up, we set ourselves, and then we start observing. And then maybe like 10 minutes after, it's like huge explosion. The building shakes, all the window breaks. And then I find myself on the ground. And I, I remember I said, what the hell is that? And then I just like crawl into like a safe room, you know? So we just got hit by a tank. He, he, sh he shelled the building just above us, like just like, wow. he missed us by like three meters. And then me and Wally, we meet in the room. And then after that, uh, we started to uh, to get small arm, small arm fire to us. Uh, <clears throat> and then we got out of the, the building. And then after that, huge firefight. I haven't. That was my first firefight. We had the Russians, they were like 50 meters from us. Uh, bullets flying everywhere, everywhere. We could not do anything. And they actually did try to surround us, right? Uh, and at that point, we had one casualty. Uh, one of our friends uh, got uh, shot at the sh shoulder by a R Russian sniper. So in his uh, right hand, he was carrying his pistol and then he was like covering his wound like that bleeding everywhere and just like and he kept running and stuff and then yeah bullets flying everywhere and then one of our Ukrainian friends said all right like we have to to get the, the hell out of it because we were not controlling the situation we were the, the one that got into fire so anyway like it was like <laughs> total chaos right and then he shot that guy saved, saved our life, that they, he shot RPG to the Russians, and it gives us en enough time to just run f for your life, right? And then I remember I was running, and then huge explosion just, just at my right. Uh, I think it was like mor mortar fire or something. Bullet just flying. And so isn't really quick, isn't PTSD also battle fatigue? How do you tell the difference? When you're in the moment, you so for some that experience. When you're in the moment, you have clarity, and then it's afterwards is when it gets foggy. It's when things are calm, when it's like calm times, and it's things aren't really going on. It's when that's when like you're you're hit with a lot of the symptoms that PTSD brings you. But when you're in these type, when people that have experienced these type of PTSD situations, this is when you're most like you're able to get get it done and but it's afterwards is when it really can it really affects you and then we had came uh, with, with vans you know like vans so everyone get in the vans as soon as possible so it was in the van it was uh, the guy that that was shot and then after that my friend Wally and then after that me but like we all had our kit on us right uh, so for me my right hand was holding uh, the head panel of the, uh, the 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 passenger seat, and I was holding the other other head panel, right? But we were too much in the van, so I couldn't close the door. So my back was outside the van, and I was holding like that. And that guy was driving like 100 kilometers in like a really residential street, right? And, and then if I had left, I would just fall and just like fall on the ground. And then I had like the, the passenger guy was still shooting at them when we left. So and then we just uh, by it's a miracle, like we just made it out of there. But I mean, yeah, and that was our first 
our first patrol, our first mission. And then from there, it just, it was, from there, it just got worse, worse. Yeah, that's what I would say. How long ago were you in the east, in Donbass? I would say about uh, maybe 10 days ago. Oh. We did uh, approximately one, one week there, because at first we, we were fighting in Irpin. Then after that, we f uh, with our group, uh, we freed the city from the, the Russian. And then me and, and my, me and Wally and, my, and our unit, we got sent uh, to fucking the east. Again, this guy was with that uh, legendary sniper Wally so from Canada. And then, yeah, in the east, it was it was total different um, experience because in urban, it was mainly urban fighting. But in the in the east, it was like the vibe was like World War II. It's like, like rain, mud, fields, um, trenches. Um, yeah, and it was hard because there was there was an entire Russian tank tank regiment on the other side of the valley, but we could not really do anything because we only had like we had one javelin with us, and actually Wally learned in two hours how to operate the javelin. He said Wally learned how to operate the javelin in two hours. And then just like that, we became a javelin operating crew, like me and Wally. So what? So they learned it, and then they became a javelin team. After that, we were we were always sent on missions with the the javelin, right? But the tanks they were like they were too far away to uh, for us to engage with the javelin. Uh, so every time we would go out, they would just shoot at us. And then there was one morning. That one morning, uh, me and Wally we left. Uh, the mission was to go uh, on a one-day mission, right? Like in the little forest um, to observe. If tanks approach, we engage them with the, with the javelin. Uh, so five o'clock, it's me uh, and Wally. We walk there. We, we walk there. It was like 1.5 kilometers in the mud and stuff. And then we arrive. We arrive on on our position, and there was uh, like a trench. And there were already two of our friends, Ukrainian, uh, in the trench, right? Uh, so Wally looked at me and he said, Hey, buddy, like, can you just stay in, in the trench? Like, you don't need to be, uh, to be outside. And I was like, all right, man, you know, like, it's pretty boring to just sit in a trench when your, your buddy, like, is, is doing some work. But, you know, I listened to him. And then I go in the trench and then the two Ukrainian, our two Ukrain, Ukrainian friends, uh, they come out of the, of the trench, right? And then w Wally said to them, hey guys, go back in the trench. And they just did not listen. And they were just smoking, just beside the trench and stuff. <clears throat> and then Wally went a little bit further to, uh, to observe like the, the Russian tanks uh, with the, he could see with his, uh, with his binoculars and then for me what i remember is uh i was in the trench and then i removed my helmet right and then i put it on the ground and like the sun is coming out and like ah, it's a pretty good day maybe i will go out and just like talk to those to my ukrainian friends right so i'm about to come out i put my first feet on the little step and then it just happened huge explosion so I fell in the trench on, on my back and it's just like in the movies, like in my ears, like ding, like that little sound. Then I'm like, what, what the hell? And then I get up, that's, and then now, and then, then I understood what, what happened. Like we just got shot by a Russian tank. Oh, wow. And it was like very precise shot. They could, they, they could see us very good, right? They shot right between our two friends. And then I got up, I put uh, back my helmet and I look, I see one of my friends dead, he's not moving. He's not moving, he's just lying on the ground. 
is there it's it sure is there like there's no way to uh, to sur to survive that <laughs> and then i looked uh, to the other one it was like j just a couple of feet uh, from me and then he was still breathing but no legs he didn't have any legs and then we made eye contact i looked at him he looked at me and then after that his head just like started to move on on his right and you could see his 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 body crisping and, and stuff so he just like passed away in front of my eyes so i was like all right so uh yeah, I just saw two of my friends die before, uh, in front of my eyes. So I, and then after after that, me and Wally, I mean, Wally saved my my life on that day because he told me to stay in the trench. Um, but the, after that, me and Wally just got together. <laughs> and then it's funny because Wally like, was saying things like, I wonder if I can get them with the javelin from here. And I was like, bro, we need to get the hell out of here. Like, there's nothing we can do. Like, we need to get out of here. And then he said, oh, I need to go get my, my sniper rifle. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he, he crawled back beside the trench. The tank showed once again at the same place. Wow. He received like, uh, like shrapnel and stuff, but like, it's fine. And then he, uh, he took, uh, he took a look on the on, on the guys just to double check but there was nothing like they were they were both dead right so he grabbed his, his sniper rifle and then he started running and then we started to run and then the, we heard the thing shoot, shooting again and then we just uh, went back to, to the base at that point so yeah that was my uh, my last uh, patrol uh, on the eastern front why are you here? Wally well, he forgot his sniper. He had to run. He had to crawl back and get it, and took tank, took a shot from the tank, going back to get his sniper rifle. Wow, that wow. So why? That's a good question. Um, I'm here to to help, right? I mean, the war started February 24th, and I just could not stay uh, stay stay at home watching on TV because you know like most most of the Western people like they see everything that goes in the news and then they think ah oh, it's sad for them but it's not here so they just close the, the TV and then they go eat eat with their kids and just keep living their life but for me I just cannot do that and then on February 28th when the president, uh, the Ukrainian president, made a, a pu public call for foreign fighters to come help, help him. Uh, I saw that the call. It was Monday at eight o'clock in the morning, and then I was in the plane uh, on Monday at eighteen, wow. eighteen hundred in the evening. I was on, on on the plane on on my way to Ukraine to help. What do you think about the Ukrainians now that you've been fighting alongside them? so they it's they are total heroes like there is no words to describe their their courage um they are very good fighters and every single of them is ready to to fight until dead until death uh to to save their uh, their country so for us we are lucky we can always go back home and like try to live a normal life but for them no like they can like their home is the one at war so that they don't have any choice to keep fighting no matter what happens speaking of back home what do you say to your family Mon famille. i'm i'm saying i am sorry for like all the stress that i am giving you but i think i have a job to do here i want to be, to do my part i i want to help those guys um so yeah i and i i hope they i hope they, they understand just one thing it struck me because you wear the canadian flag very proudly we oui. um do you think canada should be doing more of course yes sir
we are talking here about a country that has been invited totally by an other country, right? And we are talking about civilians dying every day. In Mariupol, they had 10,000 civilians dying. 10,000 civilians dying. Like, I don't know if you realize, in, I was fighting in Irpin, and then we found mass grave in Bucha, right? So, um, I understand that uh, Ukraine is not part of NATO, right? But my feel is that the world has let down Ukraine in, in a wall, uh, in a hole. Uh, just, just, you, just using the excuse, okay, Ukraine is not part of NATO, so we will just like sit back, sit back and watch, and good luck. And I mean, I would just like to say thank you for like money, uh, weapons, and stuff. But at, by, at the end of the day, um, if NATO had stepped in the war would have been done in like less than a week right and but but because everyone sits back and watch well we are seeing all those civilians die, dying and now it's day one of the war and it's still not over um and even the president Zelensky himself uh, he said that uh, the sanctions are not doing anything like you know like thank you for the, the sanctions the sanctions but it's not gonna stop the war it's not gonna do anything what do we need we need boots on the ground we need troops we need to unite together and help ukraine that's what we need prayers i'm sorry but it doesn't do anything money yes it helps um armaments yes it helps but at the end of the day the ukrainians are uh, are let alone to fight against russia we let the ukrainians fight alone against Russia and it's I cannot I like I don't have any words for this I'm just so uh, that's why I had to come here to help them because I feel that the will had let down the Ukrainians well thank you for sharing that to the discord server I was a Canadian fighting in Ukraine describes the hell all right joining us now to discuss from CBC news all right uh, this is major damage in Mariupol Theater and Museum, a clip from the the repair and, well, search and rescue efforts from the Mar Mariupol Drama Theater, southeastern port city. Major damage. A shorter clip here. Around 300 people were killed as they sheltered. 300 people killed as they sheltered when the theater was struck on March 16th. Employees of Mariupol's local history museum are attempting to recover exhibits damaged after a fire by Russian bombing. Теперь уже, как видите, осталась фактически одна голова. Нет, нет, он не упадет. This is Russian Defense Ministry shows evacuation from a Zovstal steel plant. Now, this is a video of the women, children, and the elderly that uh, are evacuating from the steel plant. Here is a picture, satellite imagery from Mariupol. Here's the Zovstal plant, and here it is from a satellite imagery. Thank you. Flaming Fury, how do you become a member? The join button on the channel. There should be a join button. It's in the description. I think our bots program. Thank you, Nora, for the $10 super chat. Welcome, Barrett Productions, to the channel. Thank you, Flaming Fury, for the 99 cent super chat. <clears throat>
Yeah, Russian soldiers, you can see the white bands. Like a civilian exchange. They got on buses and then rode buses to checkpoints that were under Ukrainian control. What a journey that must have been. See the civilians on the see they're on different buses. Going from checkpoint to checkpoint, I know. Must be a very terrifying experience. Alright, so that was video from the evacuation from the Azovstal steel plant. Here's a Fox News interview, inter exclusive Zelensky, we're losing our people. So the Fox News interviewed President Vladimir Zelensky, and here is the latest from that. The U.S. just assumed the presidency of the Uni United Nations Security Council. But yet the U.N. Security Council has failed to do anything to stop this war, anything significant. Is there time for change with the Security Council? I'm openly saying about that organization, especially on such high level, that it doesn't work. And especially the Security Council is supposed to do one specific thing, it's responsible for security. So the question is, what can it do to provide security or avert any war around the world? And the presidents of the countries that is in war and not the one who is the president for only one year. I want to say that we do not feel some sort of powerful steps to stop the aggression of Russia. Just like a person, do you feel that this organization can stop the war, any war in the world? Do you feel, I think, that the main thing of this... I ask the chat, do you guys feel that any of these major Western organizations could prevent a major war? They literally have, like, dude... Yes, they've sent billion. They've sent money. They've done nothing to prevent Russia from doing anything or stop them. Then Russia's gotten around every sanction. Do you believe Western um, government organization are are doing enough? to stop war. Ball going up. Whether it's the Hague or the UN or the or NATO or any of them, dude, EU. In my opinion, no. My personal opinion, but I want to know what you guys think. Comment in the poll. Thank you. All right. It's organization you? that I'm going to rewind some so we get the full. You start speaking in English here. Can stop the war, any war in the world. Do you feel? I think that the main thing of this organization that no, 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 people ha have people have to believe that uh, there are preventive, concrete, direct things and steps which will be uh, yes, which will be implemented if somebody wants to occupy any territory. Mm -hmm. Yes? So I, I don't feel it. Maybe, maybe somebody has, has this feeling. The EU proposed phasing out Russian energy, but it's not till the end of the year. Is that enough? So far, I think that the United States of America is the accelerator of the sanction policies, and I think they do more than any other country. 
And this is the way it should be, because they are the most powerful country right now. I see the same support with respect to sanctions from the United Kingdom. The European Union should be in a united position. They don't have it with respect to certain sanctions. For those sanctions the European Union introduced, we are thankful to them. However, they have to be thankful to themselves, because the role of Russia against Ukraine it's a war against the values that Ukraine defends. And these values are the values of the European Union countries. We created the platform of this and we prepared good document for sanctions. What of these sanctions work? What of them don't work? How we can do or involve more, more uh, deep instruments because you know russia when I, when they get some sanctions yes they are finding each day finding the way how to obey yeah, yeah. around so us yes so come in. that's it so we prepared document and also we gave this document to all the partners you also have to know it so i mean that we we are not waiting for somebody because we we are losing our people jeff Thank you, John. We have failed this country. The world has failed this country. Five dollars super chat, and then twenty-five dollars from Cool Roy says, "What leadership?" Just fascinating. That's another snippet of Griff's exclusive interview with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Uh, Griff told me he sat with him for fifty. We're Here's not backing it. Ukraine the way they were. To send, I want to do them. Let me just talk about it. Okay, we don't need to. See that. That's the interview with President Volodymyr Zelensky. Fox News sat down with him and did an interview. What else do we have for the evening? Uh, I believe now we're going to be getting to the final, the final third of uh, the documentary on the city of Mariupol, the Chronicles of Hell. We watched the first two thirds of this documentary, and we have the final third to watch. If you guys have missed it, please go watch our previous two nightly streams, and you guys can catch up. We didn't watch it in the last two afternoon streams, so it's just been a nightly stream occurrence. And so again, this is the southeastern port city of Mariupol, part three of three of the documentary, The Chronicles of Hell. And on the 14th of July, I This documentary goes into individual civilian stories of their experiences uh, in, Mar in Mariupol. There's a like a narrator that narrates and as the voice of the city of Mariupol, but all of these are stories from people that have uh, survived through what has gone on in the city. And Ну мы надеялись на то, что мы откроем. Мы, у нас был топор, лом, попросили ребят, чтобы они все это вламывали. Полчаса где-то мы пытались зайти в квартиру, ничего не получилось. Окна все были уже выбиты в подъезде. Ок, это было около шести вечера. Летали снаряды, было очень громко, было очень страшно. Я боялась, что прилетит снаряд опять на девятый этаж или восьмой или седьмой, друхнет дом. Но я хотела зайти с ним проститься, и он не пустил квартиру. Он так остался в коридоре. И 15 числа утром, когда я вышла во двор, ну так вышла, выглянула, нос один показала, потому что выйти невозможно было, стреляли очень сильно. Я увидела, что дом наш горит. И горит именно та сторона южная, которая была целая. И дом горел два дня. А может и больше. Просто на следующий день мы уже выехали. И сгорел дом вообще. И Витя погиб дважды. Один раз его убил осколками, снарядами, а второй раз он просто сгорел. И мне нечего хоронить. Просто он со мной всегда. И Мариуполь стал просто его вторым небесным домом. Как, в общем-то, для очень многих людей, которые там жили.
такого, как было в Мариуполе, не было ни в одном украинском городе. Мне кажется, никогда вообще за всю историю. А людям, которых похоронили в братских могилах, действительно повезло, потому что они погребены, над ними стоит крестик. I've gotten two notice, notices now that copyright audio and video are detected and that my stream could get blocked. So the, this one's no good for fair use, I guess. Dang it, we got two thirds through. I, I just don't want to get the stream blocked. I've gotten two notifications now I'm trying to play this. But here's the video, everybody. We made it through an hour of it. We only had, dang it, we only had 20 minutes left. I don't want to get the, the whole video taken away, but here it is, everybody. It's on your screen. I'm going to enlarge it and share it into our Discord again. I can't keep playing it. It'll block the live stream. They acquired a copyright on it. All right, I shared it into, the, shared it into our Discord server so you guys can watch and then go support this channel. All right, it's called The Chronicles of Hell, Mariupol, The Chronicles of Hell. All right, I highlighted it right here, and I also shared it into our Discord server, all right? Shared into our server, here it is on screen, and you guys can go watch the rest of it or watch this all in its entirety if you've missed any of it, all right? Mariupol, The Chronicles of Hell, all right. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you again. This has been night 73 of the war in Ukraine covering it. We've been covering this since day one. I'm an independent journalist, U.S. Army veteran. Everything too, I hope you guys, if you haven't, please go subscribe to our gaming channel. Um, I've been playing the Metal Gear Solid franchise from start to finish. Um, we've been playing two episodes of Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater to this point, And I'm going to be playing more of that tomorrow night. We put, look for that stream at 9 p.m., uh, 9 p.m. Central Time, Sunday night, all right? Thank you guys so much again for choosing Mercado Media. Again, I'm your host, Andrew Mercado. I hope you guys have a wonderful Saturday night. Uh, and I'll be live again with the news coverage Monday afternoon, all right? I'll be live again Monday afternoon at 1 p.m. That's the new, the new time frame for earlier stream, one to, about 1 to 3. And then I'm going to try to make a video. Thing took forever today. I didn't get it done in time before this stream. So I'm definitely going to be doing a couple hour stream in the daytime. And then I'll be, do a couple hour stream in the in the evening. I'm going to have to fig figure out what to do with Facebook. I'm going to have to figure out what to do with that thing, y'all. But all right. You guys have a wonderful Saturday night. Again, tune in to our video games tomorrow night for gaming. If you guys missed part one to the stream after the stream ends, just go back and watch the first half hour. Um, of this live stream it should already be posted and good to go this was part two of our nightly coverage ukraine war night 73 you guys have a wonderful evening i'll see you guys monday